Hi, everyone. I'm Wiley Blevins. I'd like to welcome you to my grade 335 phonics survival guide. As I travel around the country, I'm encountering increasingly larger numbers of students who enter grades three, four, and five without the strongest foundation in phonics that they need to be successful reading grade level content. And many of the grade three through five teachers that I work with either didn't teach the primary grades or aren't as familiar with some of those high impact phonics and structural routines. And because their students lack those foundational skills, they are required now to provide some of that instruction. So what I thought I would do during this session is share with you some of those high impact routines that we typically use in the primary grades that you can use in grades three through five with a few slight modifications for older students as you reteach or develop fluency with some of those foundational skills that they have yet to master, but they need to in order to become successful readers. So the very first thing we need to do is find out where are those phonics instructional needs. So there are two assessments that I give at the beginning of the year, and I can provide these if you don't have anything like this available. One is a comprehensive phonics survey, and the other is a comprehensive spelling survey. The comprehensive phonics survey, which you see here, must be administered one-on-one. -on -one. So I recommend that you only administer this to those students for which you have some concerns about. The way this assessment is organized is around skill categories to give you some insights into where you can begin the extra instruction that you'll provide to fill in those instructional holes. So this is a nonsense word test. And here again, it is organized around big categories of skills. So you'll see some short vowel nonsense words. You'll see some words that are short vowels with consonant blends and digraphs. So blends like ST or BL and digraphs are those two letters that together stand for one sound like SH or CH. The next category are long vowel spellings. Then we have our complex vowel spellings and finally our multisyllabic words. So as you administer this test, and it takes about a minute, a minute and a half per child, you mark whether or not they got it correct. If they made a mistake, you can record their mistake because you can get some insights into, into some, some uh, things that they're doing or attempting when they're decoding words. And where they start to fall apart, where they start making several mistakes, that would be the category of skills in which you would begin that additional instruction. So to confirm that that is the appropriate starting point, I also give my comprehensive spelling survey. Now we know that students spelling lags behind their reading. So chances are, if they are struggling with some of those, those skills in reading, they're struggling with them in spelling as well. And maybe some earlier skills. You've, you've all encountered children who can read words with skills okay, but really lack the spelling ability. Spelling takes longer, it needs more intensity. So this gives me some insights into some of those needs. And here again, it's organized around categories, short vowels, short vowel words with consonant blends like GL, DR, ST, short vowel words with consonant digraphs like TH, CH, and SH, final E or silent E words like vote and grace and hive, Words with long vowel spellings like train and soap and beam. Words with complex vowel spellings. Those are your diphthongs like oi or your R controlled vowels like AR, ER, IR, UR. Then some multisyllabic words. I started with some words with prefixes and suffixes, common word chunks to see if students are recognizing them. And then some multisyllabic words where I've, I've looked at the different syllable types and created words using those, those syllable types. Now this can be administered whole class. So you can provide this for all your students at the beginning of the school year. I recommend you only do two or three sections a day. So that would take about maybe 10 minutes to get through a few of these, a few of these sections. And by the time you get through that first week, you will have the data that you need to make some determinations about where the lowest level deficits are because all of these assessments go from skills that should be easier to more complex. And that gives you a starting point and you can form some small groups around those specific needs. But what do you do after you have that information? 
Well, you need to have a structure in place and it can be a very simple structure. Let's say you only have maybe 10, 10 to 15 minutes at most to do any kind of small group work with these students. Or maybe you have a teacher's aide or someone who can assist you in providing this instruction. So I tend to do three small parts each day and keep a very consistent structure and you can build out from the structure. I always start with a couple of minutes doing something that is a cumulative review. It could be really basic. It could be me having a set of letter cards or spelling cards that have all of the sound spellings that we're working on. It could be consonants, it could be blends, it could be vowel spellings, it could be prefixes, it could be syllables, wherever you are, whatever those students need. And all you do is you just flash these cards and they say the spellings to keep those sound spellings fresh in their memories and also gives you a sense of which ones they still haven't mastered by sight in terms of recognizing them automatically. Another thing that you could do for a community review is a very quick reread of something that you read in a previous day. Very quick read, you could, you could listen in, maybe they whisper read it or, or, or what have you, but something very, very short. And then you're gonna do some instruction around that new skill. So I do one kind of activity each day. Here again, you only have a few minutes. So the first day I'm gonna do something around blending. I'm gonna show you all of these routines in just a second. So I'm gonna explicitly introduce the new sound spellings that we're gonna be working on and give students a small set of words where I'm going to model how to blend or sound out a few of those. And students will have practice reading the rest of those. And this will be a small set of words that we will use the entire week and they can practice them also independently or with partners and so on. The second day I wanna do some dictation. Dictation is guided spelling. It's where you have a conversation with students and show them how to transfer what they've learned in reading into writing. So it's that formal modeling that really helps them think about how to use those spellings, where those spellings appear in words, if there are multiple spellings for a sound and so on. And you can have those rich conversations. On the third day, I do word building. Here again, this is an activity that builds spelling because children are using a small set of letter cards and building a series of words that are related in some way. And they get really flexible with their use of those sound spellings. But word building also builds some other important skills, some very sophisticated phonemic awareness skills that also reinforces decoding. So it does a lot in a very short period of time. On day four, I would do a word sort where I'd give students a set of words that have common spelling patterns, these larger chunks. And we have conversations about what we notice about these spelling patterns. I'll give you a couple of very clear examples in, in, in a little bit later in the presentation. And then the last day I would do a word ladder where we're gonna build a series of words and I give students a clue about what they need to change in terms of their spelling and connect it to meaning. So all of these activities give students a lot of decoding practice, reading words with a new skill, a lot of encoding practice where they're spelling words with a new skill, and a few other things we're gonna hit like phonemic awareness, the understanding that words are made up of individual sounds and also a little bit of vocabulary work. So these are quick activities that take maybe five to seven minutes each. And then we're gonna read something. We're gonna read some decodable text, some text that has a high concentration of words with the skill that we want students to master so that they have lots of practice applying the skill to get to fluency quickly. Now, you might have some great appropriate decodable text. There are a few companies that make them for older students who are, who are struggling with some of those uh, foundational skills from the primary grades you might have to dip in and use some of those decodable texts from the primary grade teachers. You can also create some of your own sentences, decodable sentences, maybe five sentences that the students read that have a lot of words, the new skill, whatever works for you based on the resources that you have available. But there are other things we can do with these texts that are really important for our older, our older learners. And we'll go through some of those as well. So let's start in with some of these routines. The first routine is blending. Blending is the primary strategy we teach children to sound out words. It's a strategy that needs to be modeled and needs to be frequently applied for students to become fluent reading words with those skills. So you'll see we are going to introduce that new skill on Monday and do some blending work with that. You all know what it is. You, you've 
either done it yourself or you were taught it when you were in school, the most common way of blending or modeling blending really is just to run your finger under the letters of a word as you string together or sing together those sounds. So if it was a very simple word like this, I would run my finger under the letters and as I go from letter to letter, I go from sound to sound in a continuous or successive way. So I would go sat, then I'd go a little faster, sat. What's the word? And the students would say sat. So you'd model a couple of those using the new sound spellings and then give students a list of words that they are going to practice reading with you. You're going to listen in and provide corrective feedback and this is what I call blending lines, a set of words. This is just an example of some blending lines and you wouldn't do this many, so don't, don't, don't get worried about that. But this is, these are some words around some complex vowel spellings. Here we are focusing on our controlled vowel spelling, A-R. Now, this is a lot of words. You might, because of the time you have, maybe just create a list of maybe eight to 12 words that you've put on a piece of paper that you make a copy of that students are going to use in subsequent days. You're gonna practice reading these words every single day. They're gonna underline the spellings and say the sounds as they underline the spellings, uh, the sounds of that target, that target phonics skill. They might do a little bit of work with uh, using some of those words to write some sentences or what have you. There are other kinds of activities that you, that you can do. So if I'm working with a third or fourth grader, who needs some work on, on complex vowels. And this particular week, I'm working on our controlled vowels. I will give them a small set of words, one syllable words working in that skill. But it's very important for your older students that you're always leveling up. So yes, they're here. They need to work on those one syllable words. But the grade level expectations are here. So I want to give them that little nudge, give them that challenge. So I always do what I call transition to longer words work in the blending work, especially for older students. So we might do some very simple words like car and cart and star and start and so on. And then I'll take a couple of those simple one syllable words like hard or large or farm or start and add on word parts. It could be a prefix. It could be a suffix. It could be a syllable type. So we've read some simple words that are one syllable, and then I take one of those one syllable words like hard, and we go to harder and hardest, or large, and we go to larger and largest, or farm, and we go to farmer, or start, and we go to starting. You see what I'm doing? So yeah, we're working on one syllable words as a skill. That's what they need, but we're also doing a few multisyllabic words to give them some practice with that in a way that's a bit easier because they already have some familiarity with the familiarity with a big chunk of that word. So always think about how you can level up, not keeping them here, starting here and just nudge, starting here and nudge. And that will be a more successful experience, a more successful activity for them. If you're looking for a word list, there are certainly books out there. These are some of the books that I've created. They have lots of word lists, but you can just go on the computer and type in words with AR and you're going to get lots of lists for those. So they are, there are lots of easy ways to find a set of words that you can use. I highly recommend that you use high utility words, really common words that students are most likely to encounter in reading or, in, or use in their writing because you want your students to learn those first because they will have the most impact on their reading and spelling growth because they're the words that they're most likely to, to see or need. Uh, and then you can branch out from there. That's just my, my recommendation. There are some fun activities you can do with older students. This is an electronic activity. You don't have to do electronic. These are just spinners. You can make spinners offline. Let me show you this next slide because these are some teachers who have made their own spinners for their students. But what you do is you put consonants, consonant blends or consonant digraphs on the first and third spinner. And then in the middle spinner, you would put whatever vowel spellings you're working on. So the children spin the spinners, they sound out the word that's formed and they decide if it's a real word or a nonsense word. If it's a real word, then you can create a list. So this is a fun activity that gives them lots of practice blending in a game-like atmosphere, but really meaty blending practice. And also gives them an opportunity to figure out, is it a real word or not, which helps them when they take those nonsense word assessment. Other type of game-like, oh, and there are many, 
programs out there that have these. Those of you who are familiar with my, my resources from Sadler, these are already available digitally, uh, very simple spinners for beginning skills like short vowels and more advanced spinners for uh, reading multisyllabic words. So you might not use three spinners for your multisyllabic words if you're just transitioning to two syllable words, you, but you can put the syllables on two spinners and do the same kind of thing. Really, really fun. The other thing that you can do is write some high utility spelling patterns. So if you're working on a particular skill, you might choose a few of those, those most common spelling patterns. And here again, those resources that I showed you, like phonics from A to Z and the, the, the uh, upper grade phonics book that I showed you have words organized around, around spelling patterns. And then you give students some dice or some cues that you've written consonants, consonant blends, and consonant digraphs on. They spin the cubes and they see how many of those spellings that they can use to make words. They're really fun activities to do in with partners or in small groups. Here again, just another way to add some engagement to students who might not be as excited to be working on some, some basic skills, but you can add a level of fun that uh, really makes it a, a purposeful activity and an engaging activity. The other thing that I recommend are what I call my speed drills or fluency drills. What I do is I create a sheet of words here I have 100 word, you could, you could limit it to 50. They're not 100 different words. What they are is I will create two rows of words. So these are 10 words and I repeat them multiple times in the first half of the speed drill. And then I, and these are one syllable words on top. And then on bottom, I write some multisyllabic words, two rows. So just 10 words and I repeat them multiple times in random order. So the students practice reading one syllable words with the skill we're working on. And then at the bottom, they read some multisyllabic words. So here again, I can level it up. If they're really struggling with the bottom half, we'll just work with the top half for a while. But the, the basic concept behind this is that here again, like the blending lines, we have a small set of words that they're practicing reading every day. And the way this works is that the students practice reading these and either you or a partner will time them to see how many they can read in a minute. So the goal is to try to get through all of these in a minute. So they record their score then they practice them on their own and try to get better and they record them again. And it has this motivational aspect, but the repetition in reading these words pretty much guarantees that they'll have a small set of words that you can then carry on to subsequent weeks instruction around that particular skill. So this is also a really fun, engaging way to give them some more reading practice with words with the new skill at the, um, at the word level. Dictation is another really important uh, routine that we will be using. And here again, we're gonna do this on our second day. So we were read some words with the skill. Now we wanna talk about how we can transfer those, those spellings into writing, which is much more difficult. So we wanna really break it down for students and, 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 and talk about how we do that in ways that will help them understand how words work. So in the primary grades, dictation starts with what we call phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is just the understanding that words are made up of individual sounds and children need to be able to pick out and manipulate those sounds in order to become effective readers and writers. So an activity we might do with kindergartners is just to have them stretch sounds. So I will say a word like sap, and I will say, I want you to stretch the sounds in sap with me. And so I'll give them what I call a pretend rubber band, because <laughs> those are affordable. And I just have children grab the rubber bands and we stretch the sounds. So we do that with sap, we go sat. I'm just stretching those sounds. And then I give them what are called sound boxes and counters. And what they're going to do is they stretch the sounds, they're gonna move one counter onto each box. So it would look something like this. That. So we physically mark the sounds. Now this is something that many of your students in grades three, four, and five will need to do because they haven't had this kind of work, these experiences with these spelling patterns, with these particular phonics skills in the primary grades. So after we've broken it apart, we're gonna replace each counter 
with a spelling. And that's where you're gonna have these conversations and guide them through it. So we've just stretched and marked the sounds in a word like sat. So I've asked children, what's the first sound in sat? If they don't know, I will stretch it for them. Sat, what's that first sound? What letter do we write for the sound? And they would replace that counter with the letter S. And we work through the word that way. You can do this with short vowels, with consonant blends, with consonant digraphs, with long vowels, and so on. Once you get to more complex words like multisyllabic, you wouldn't do this necessarily anymore unless you did syllable boxes, which, which you could do. But this really lays the groundwork and really helps you know, can children segment words? In order to spell a word that children haven't memorized, they have to think about the individual sounds and attach a letter or spelling to each of those sounds. So this work is really impactful. So then that leads to more formal dictation <clears throat> that you can do with older students. So I like to start with a few words and sound boxes. So here are some long A words, chain, gray, and train. So I'll give students sound boxes and we will physically, you could tap it if you don't have counters, we tap the sounds and chain. Shh. Ain. There are those three sounds. And I say, what's that first sound? Shh. What letters have we learned for that sound? And so we'd write the letter CH. And if they don't know, I would reinforce that. They would write it and so on. So we do a few words really structured in this way. So we'd write chain, AI is in the middle. Gray, AY is the end and train AI is somewhere here in the middle because those are the two long A spellings I'm working on in this particular activity. It's helpful to stop at that point and ask a question. Like, what do you notice about where these spellings appear in these words? Because you want children to notice that AI only appears in the middle of the word. It can never appear at the end, but AY appears at the end. That little piece of information helps them understand where different spellings for the long A sound might appear in words when they read and write, because they might not have any idea. They might not have spent time observing words in that way. So these kinds of, of little insights, these kinds of conversations during this activity can be very enlightening. And then I give them a couple words in a simple sentence without all the structure to see how they do. And so you want to start with some scaffolds, take away those scaffolds, and over time you can use those scaffolds less and less unless students need that level of support. So when it comes to dictation, it's also really important that we level up. So maybe you're teaching third grade and you want students to write lots of words with, with prefixes like retraining, long multisyllabic words but you know you have a lot of students who aren't there. Say you're doing a whole group lesson. So there are things that you can fold into whole group lessons that would also support these students who need some work with these basic skills. So if I'm expecting my students to spell words like retraining, I know a lot of them aren't there. I will backtrack as far as I need to go based on the widest range of student needs. So I will build a series of words that build up to my grade level expectations. So I might start with train and just have them, I'll dictate train and have them write train and we can have that conversation. Maybe they're struggling with that initial blend. True. So we'll break apart those two sounds and think about that spelling. Or maybe they're struggling with the long A spelling. We'll talk about AIs in the middle, AYs at the end. What are you gonna use in train? Where does that sound appear? And then we go to training, so we're just adding the suffix. Then we go to retraining, so we're adding the prefix. So it feels so much easier when you build words in that way. And all children are doing some grade level work, but many of them are starting a little bit lower where they might need that support. You might have some students who you have to start much earlier. Maybe you have some who are still struggling with short vowels who start with ran and go to ray. Think about well, what sound do you hear that's different? What are those spelling? What spellings do we know for long A? Where what spelling might be best here if AI appears in the middle and AY, you know, those kinds of conversations uh, can be super, super helpful. Also, dictation around spelling changes when adding suffixes. A lot of students, even grade level students, struggle with this. So going from happy to happily to happiness. 
doing lots of dictation week after week a week, just with those common spelling changes when adding suffixes or spelling multisyllabic words with common word parts. Maybe you're doing some work with prefixes like un and re, and you want students to spell a bunch of words with those prefixes and say, I want you to spell the word reread, but let's start with re. So they see that, they spell it as a chunk, and then they tack on the re part. So you want students to start, start seeing these larger chunks of words and dictation can afford you opportunities to do that for your students and for them to, to uh, get some of that really important practice. The other thing you want to do is evaluate student writing. Students are all over the place in terms of their spelling ability. It's very helpful <clears throat> to have just a very simple chart in Students Writer's Notebook where you list the skills that you're going to be working on that year. If you have students who are below grade level expectations, maybe you have a chart for them that just lists the skills you're going to be working on in phonics that you want to make sure they're carrying over to, to their, their spelling. And the way this works, it's a very simple chart. You see skill, you see a column for mastery and a column for example. So when I'm working on a skill with students, we circle it. That indicates to them that I'm holding them accountable for that skill. Periodically, maybe once every three to four weeks, you'll look at their most recent writings through a phonics lens. So I see that these are the skills that are circled. These are the skills that I taught. So I'm going to look for words with those skills in their writing. And if I see evidence that they are consistently and accurately using those skills in spelling, then I'll put a check mark, which means they're moving toward mastery. And I'll record some of the words that I see with those skills to celebrate their progress. And then at a glance, you know, every three to four weeks, I can, I can look at the student's writer's notebook and see, oh, there are a bunch of things that are still circled. But we haven't achieve mastery yet. So let's do some more dictation work. Let's do some more word building work and so on with those skills. So that's another simple tool that you can use to stay on top of students' differentiated needs when it comes to spelling, which can be very difficult to stay on top of. Another routine is word building, and that's the routine we're going to use on the third day. This is one of my favorite things to do with students. It's very game-like. It's very fun but it has such an impact because it does so much of what we need to do. There are different ways to do word building. Word building, you just give students a set of letter cards. If you're working with bigger words, it would be syllable cards. You can have children build a series of words where you tell them what to change. So you could ask them to build the word sad, for example, and say, change S to M. What's the word? And they would sound out the word mad. That's just practicing blending. So you might start that, uh, you might do a series of words that way, but you want to then repeat those words with a word awareness focus. And a word awareness focus is where you don't tell children what to change. So you have them build the word sad and say, I want you to go from sad to mad. And they have to decide what to change. Why this is so purposeful is when they have to go from sad to mad, they are having to mentally manipulate sounds and words. So that's that really sophisticated phonemic awareness work. They're substituting those sounds. And they have to show that mental substitution with letter cards by creating the word that they formed when they made that substitution. So that is that encoding or spelling work. And then they have to read it to see if it's correct. So that's decoding work. So in one activity, we're doing some meaty phonemic awareness, some meaty encoding or spelling, and some meaty decoding or reading work. So this is why this activity is so powerful and impactful. And it creates this flexibility using those letter sounds. So this would be a very early example, but I'd give students a small set of letter cards, maybe eight to 10. If you have a magnetic letter board and some programs are creating these magnetic, which have all the spellings, that's even easier to, to do. But then I just create a series of words that vary slightly. So here again, this is a, a really basic example for working on short vowels. So these are students who, who really had to go way back in terms of their phonics needs. So you see, I started with sad, have them change sad to mad, and then mad to map, and then map to mop, and mop to top, and top to tap, and tap to mat. You see how I'm bouncing all around, you know, initial letter, final letter, those medial vowels, which are harder, you know, contrasting the short A and the short O. 
really, really helpful. As we get into some more sophisticated skills, maybe they're struggling with those blends and die graphs. So I could start with the word like hop and go to chop. They have to know that the CH together uh, works to, to uh, represent that ch sound and then chop to chip and then chip to ship. So they have to know the difference between ch and sh and the CH and the SH. You see how much deep thinking about words and as they're going through, you can really guide them and reinforce these spellings. You can help them segment the sounds of the word. Think about what is different between hop and chop, what sound is different, where in the word. These rich conversations can really help move the needle with, with uh, students who might be struggling with these skills. As you move up to the grades, you can do the same kind of thing with syllable cards. For grade level students, I do a lot of work with the top 322 syllables in English. If you aren't familiar with them, I can certainly send you a list of those. But I will have students build just a small series of words with those syllables. So I'll say, make the word prescriptive. So they'll use those three syllables. I want you to change prescriptive to prescription. What do you have to change? Now I want you to change prescription to prevention. What do you have to change? Now change prevention to invention. And so you see they've had this work thinking about these big chunks, but they're getting a lot of practice seeing spellings like T-I-O-N as a recognizable chunk or T-I-V-E as a recognizable chunk or P-R-E as a recognizable chunk, which we want them to be able to do. So when they see longer, more complex words with these common syllables, they explode off the page. The word doesn't seem so complex because they already recognize some of the big chunks of that. And this kind of activity can really help with that. Word ladders are another really fun activity. This is what I do at the end of the week. I put it here in the sequence because it really is word building, but with a slight twist, a vocabulary twist. Now, Tim Rosinski popularized word ladders. If you don't follow Tim Rosinski on uh, Twitter, I highly encourage you to because he every week provides some free uh, word ladders that you can use with your students. Often they're around events or holidays or, or topics that your students would find very interesting in a wide range of grade levels. He also does some tremendous work of morphology, which is beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but he provides some free resources around that as well. The way a word ladder works is you just have children write a series of words. They go up the ladder and you can have as many words as you want, but you, you give them a starter word. Here I chose the word grain, and then you give them a clue. And the clue has a vocabulary aspect to it. So I tell children, I want you to change one letter in the word grain to make something that runs on a track and it goes choo-choo. So what are they going to make? What word are they going to write? Train. I want you to change I want you to take away one letter in train to name something that falls from the clouds. But where are they gonna make? So here again, they're, they're seeing the letters and thinking about what they have to manipulate. Could be uh, changing a letter, removing a letter, adding a letter for very young readers. Uh, as you get to older readers, you can change larger word chunks, larger word parts. Children love doing this, but it's such meaty spelling work and thinking about what's different in words and attaching it to meaning. So it does a lot of different things that are really important for these students who might be struggling. Here again, these are joyful kinds of routines that you can do. A lot of students might not be excited to be moved to the back of the room to do some phonics work, but these are the kinds of activities they will really love and they're highly impactful. So word sorts is another very common activity. You probably do word sorts all the time with your students. With our very young students, I will want that to be a part of the five-day sequence. Here, I'm doing it on day four. There are a couple things about word sorts I think are really important for you to, to keep in mind. This might be a word sort I would do if students were struggling in that long vowel category. So I'd work on spelling long A, long E, long I, long O, and so on. So I'd give them a small set of words like road, show, grow, boat, and have them sort them by common spelling pattern, O-A and O-W. Now, in a lot of classrooms that I go to, that's what a sort is, just moving cards into piles. But sorts were never intended to be that. The real value in a sort is the conversation you have after the sort is completed. When you ask students, what did you notice about these words? Or what did you learn about these spelling patterns? 
that's where the real learning occurs. Because if I go back to these long O words, you'll notice, and students should notice that the spellings, O-A and O-W, are different in terms of where they appear in a word. If students don't notice this, I will guide them to recognize this, that the O-A spelling never appears at the end of a word, but the O-W spelling can. So when they're writing a new word with long O, like the word snow, for the first time, what are they doing? They're thinking about each individual sound, S-N-O, and attaching a letter or spelling to that sound. So S N and O, it's the last sound. I have some choices, O-A and O-W, what am I going to use? Well, we just did a sword, we know O-A can't appear at the end, so O-W is a more appropriate choice. That's the power of these conversations. These sorts and these conversations increase in their value as you move up the grades. So certainly with these early skills, we might wanna point out where different spellings appear in words, especially with these long vowel spellings, there are some distinct differences that are really important to point out to children. You might have children notice common spelling patterns that they can use uh, and look for in other words. As we go up through the grades, those conversations can get more sophisticated. So one of the classic examples is when words get complex and spellings get a similar and a little bit confusing, like words that end in E-N-C and A-N-C can be really difficult for people to spell. Maybe they're difficult for you to spell. Maybe when you write excellence or difference or fragrance and you get to the end, you're not really sure if it's E-N-C-E or A-N-C, so you just type it and hope that spell check corrects it or what have you, but the reality is a word sort can clarify how simple those spellings really are. So in a word sort, if I'm sorting different, which ends in E-N-T, and you all know that different ends in E-N-T because you see that word all the time, how would you expect to spell difference? If difference ends in E-N-T, difference ends in E-N-C-E. Excellent ends in E-N-T. How would we spell excellence? E-N-C-E. -E. If I tell my students that fragrant ends in A-N-T, and I want to spell fragrance, how would I spell it? A-N-C-E. E-N-T, E-N-C-E. A-N-T, A-N-C. -E. That sort is really powerful in terms of children starting to notice related words and how those spellings are connected. Once they start creating this, this word awareness, this word consciousness, which we can really develop in these word sorts, it makes the spelling of words even easier. This related word work is so important for all of our students. Uh, some very simple words like sign seem really confusing to children. Why is there a G and sign, S-I-G, and it makes no sense, but if you connect sign to signal and signature, the G makes sense. Same thing with the word health. Why is the F sound spelled E-A? Normally E-A makes the long E sound, but if you connect health and healthy and healthful to the word heal, all of a sudden that E-A makes sense, the simpler word. Uh, so here again, I encourage you to have these really rich conversations and do a lot of related word work so children see those commonalities across words. There are different kinds of sorts. Closed sorts are the kind we just did where you tell children how to sort them. You might want to repeat a closed sort and do what's called a time sort where you give children just a short period of time to sort those words. When you do a time sort, it's really great to organize a series of words around bigger pieces of words like phonograms. Instead of just O-A and O-W, maybe it's O-A-T and O-W-N words or what have you. So they start seeing these larger pieces, which you want them to see in other words. It's really important that when you do a sort, you do it through multiple lenses. So you'll do a sort through a phonics lens where you're looking at the spelling patterns. And then maybe you'll resort the words through a vocabulary or a part of speech kind of lens. Maybe you'll have children sort all the words by noun, verb, and adjective, or all the words that describe an animal versus describe a person or so on. So that children begin seeing that words have all of these aspects. There's the phonology, the sounds, the spellings, but there's also the morphology, the, the meaning. And so when they start seeing that words have all these pieces, that's going to be really important for them as they move up to the grades when they start learning these larger word chunks that 
they can use to sound out words, but also to get at word meaning. We want to develop that habit from early on. So repeating a sort in these two different ways can also be really helpful for these students. I want to talk a little bit about high frequency words. There's certainly a lot of high frequency word assessments out there. High frequency words are the most common words in English, and some children might struggle with them. There are only about 100 words that account for about half the words children will see in print. These are high impact words. Some of them are what we call irregular. They don't follow those common sound spellings that we teach our young learners. So we have to address them uh, with more intentionality and in a slightly different way. So there's been a lot of talk about how we address these in the science of reading conversations that we have now. There's this process called orthographic mapping, how children map words into memory so they can automatically retrieve them. And we know what happens now because of brain researchers who take these, these, these brain pictures that are called functional MRIs, where they show what parts of the brain are activated when, when we are reading and what parts need to be activated to really know a word. So that has caused us to think differently about how we teach high frequency words. So the traditional way, certainly the way I was taught them, years ago when I was in first grade, was my teacher, Mrs. Warshaw, would write a context sentence on the board like, I see a cat. She would underline the new word and say it. This is the word C. What's the word class? We'd all say C. So we focused on seeing the word and hearing the word. But we know from brain research and orthographic mapping and the parts that need to light up that there are really three parts of our brain that need to be activated for us to know a word. There are the parts where the sounds are stored. So when my teacher, Mrs. Warshaw, said the word C, and I repeated that word, I heard it. So that part of my brain was activated. There's the part where the meaning is stored. So that context sentence activated that part of my brain. But the part that wasn't activated is the part where the letters are stored. Even if a word is irregular, we have to attend to the, the sounds and the individual spellings of the word. So for a long time, for many years, these high frequency words were just taught as big chunks, you know, these big amorphous chunks. Uh, and sometimes uh, teachers would put shapes around them or what have you. We know that that doesn't work. So you have a lot of children who really didn't analyze these words in a way that helped them orthographically map them so they can automatically retrieve them. So we have to teach these a bit differently. So the routine that I recommend if you have students who are struggling with some of these is what I call the read, spell, write routine. So you can take a small set of words that students are struggling with and maybe just do a small set each week. So I would begin by writing each word in a context sentence. So if the word we're working on this week, one of them is said, I would write a simple sentence like, I see a cat said Pam. I would have children read the word. What's the word? Said. And then we are going to do some of this, what I call orthographic mapping. We're going to attend to the individual sounds and spelling. So it asks children, what sounds do you hear and said? Let's say those sounds. Said. So we would isolate those three sounds. And then we would look at the spellings. I know that these students, because I've assessed them, that they already know that the letter S stands for S and the letter D stands for D. I could point that out. But I, what I really want to do is focus their attention on the part that is irregular, the part that doesn't follow the rules, the part that they have to remember. So I ask them, what was that middle sound in said again? Said the S sound. How do we typically write the E eh sound, right? The letter E. Do you see the letter E here? No. How do we write the S sound in this word? And I will highlight in some way the AI spelling, which is the irregular part, the part they have to remember by heart. So I might underline it. I might circle it. I might write it in a different color. Uh, a very popular technique is called heart words, where teachers will put a heart above the spelling and tell them that's the part you have to remember by heart. Whatever you do is fine, just to draw their attention to it. And then we'll spell it corally together, S-A-I-D, that I have students write it as they say the letters S-A-I-D, read, spell, write. We activated the meaning with the context sentence, the letters where I highlighted the irregular spelling, and then we spelled it out loud and said the letters as we wrote it, and then the sounds. 
They heard the word as a whole, and we segmented the individual sounds of the word, mapping into memory more efficiently so that we can automatically retrieve it. So that's the kind of work you might have to do for those words that are more difficult. So I have lists of high frequency words that you can use in some of my some of my resources. I think a lot about which ones I'm going to focus my attention on. Probably you'll have students who need more work with those irregular ones. But when you're doing your phonics lessons, you know, if you're doing words with short A, in fact, before I do that, I just want to show you in the top 250 words in English, there are about 60 that are irregular, and these are some of them. You know, the word the, which is the most common word, said, what you need in dialogue, they and you, pronouns, what, where, and who, or question words. There are a lot of really important words that some of your students might be struggling with. So you're gonna to have to do a lot of work with these. But when I'm teaching my phonics lessons and I wanna choose some great words, and here again, I can send you this list. I have a list where I've just organized words, the top 250 words based on skill. So here's short A. I have a column of very simple short A words that I might use in my blending work or word building. I have some words that are a little more complex if students are ready for the challenge and I have some multisyllabic words with that skill. So I have different kinds of words I can use for students at, at various levels of proficiency. Master lists of all of these that I'm happy to share with anyone who, who wants them. And so that can help you choose some high impact words for some of the activities that you're creating and save you a bit of time. There are words that look irregular, but actually they're part of families. I call them irregular families. Like the word there has a word that rhymes with it, but ends in E-R-E. That's the word where, as you know. There are a lot of words like that, to, do, and who, come and some, give and live, could, should, and would. So if you have students who are struggling with any of these words, teach them as families. You know, teach could, should, and would as a family. Highlight that pattern that they share. If you're teaching words like give and live, make sure you point out some aspects of spelling that will help them. In English, there are no words that end in the letter V, no English words that end in the letter V. So if children are writing word that ends in the V sound, they have to add an E. That's a very helpful kind of tip that you can share with them. If you have children who are spelling have H-A-V, they haven't learned that generalization about how English works. So it's helpful to share that with them and get them quickly over that, that hurdle. There are words that a lot of children have problems with that we need more instructional uh, intentionality around. And so these are words that your students might be struggling with. Reversals like on and no and was and saw, they could struggle in reading or writing with those. Words like of, for, and from, which are very difficult to attach to meaning, look very similarly. Uh, words that begin with TH and WH like there and where, then and when, that and what. And also a few of these words like one and once that don't really look the way they sound can be particularly problematic. So, you know, take a look at this list. Maybe you start with, with some words on this list during those extra lessons to make sure the words that we know many children struggle with, that you do a little more work with them to get students over that hurdle because these are high impact words, the words that they're gonna see a lot and use a lot in their writing. So uh, some extra work. If you have children who need some independent practice, when you get to that read, spell, write routine, you get to the right part, have them write the word on one side of an index card. And then on the back, co-construct a simple sentence. Like for C, these are some students I worked with in New York City. For C, we wrote, can you see? For down, we wrote, sit down, something they heard a lot. For now, we wrote, not now. So what they did is they practiced the words in isolation and they practiced them in context because you want to increase the amount of times children see these in context. It doesn't have to be a sentence. It could be a phrase. Here are uh, cards we created for the words from and of, which are two of the confusing of for and from. So for from, the students wrote, I am from, and they drew a flag of the country they were from. This particular year, I was working with a lot of children from the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. So they drew the flag of where they're from. And then for of, because it's New York City and we're, we're known for grabbing a slice of pizza, folding it and walking down the street, we just came up with the phrase, a slice of pizza but they practice the words in isolation, flipped over, practice in context. And these context sentences also help those students who are multilingual learners deepen their understanding of when to use from versus when to use of. So it was another example that helped them along that, that way. You can have students 
keep writer's notebooks or a section of their writer's notebook just for this high frequency word work. One of the things I do with young learners that you could do with your older learners is each week, whatever words you're working on, have them create their own sentences in the back. So if you're teaching four words this week, have them create one sentence for each of the words, not ones that you co-construct, but ones they do in the next week for the next week for and so on. The way you can get more instructional mileage out of this activity is then assign some time each week for them to read their sentences from the beginning of the year to a partner or to you or to a teacher's aide or so on. So the sentences they wrote week one, by the time you get to week 20, they've read those 20 times. That increases the amount of context. Also, it's a really nice reflection of their writing progress. So as you've been working on these phonics skills, their spelling should improve. As you're working in your writing curriculum on grammar and punctuation and capitalization, those things should improve. So you'll see that progress throughout the year. So you can use those sentences when you're conferencing with students. Or one of the things you might notice that we notice with very young children is as they progress through the year and they're reading those sentences week after week, they start correcting some of their errors. So you can celebrate the things they're noticing in their writing because they have this consistent practice looking at these sentences over and over and over. The last sort of big routine is around the reading of any kind of decodable text. So we're gonna read something every week. Finding materials might be your biggest challenge in meeting those students' needs, finding great appropriate kinds of materials. There are some that are out there. There are some free resources that you might be able to find. Certainly you can dip into books from um, the primary grades, although it's sort of hard to find ones that uh, older students won't find offensive or problematic. If you've the nonfiction ones tend to be my go-to because they often have photographs or illustrations that feel a bit older and more mature. And so those are good, but you can also just create five sentences for the students to read and construct them yourselves. It's much easier than writing a story, certainly. And you can be very careful about the kinds of words you put in those sentences and you just practice reading those. But if you have decodable text, I really encourage you to do more with them. We know that we want students to have lots of opportunities to practice sounding out words with the new skills that we're teaching. And when they're reading these, it gives us opportunities to model how to decode or sound out words. So that's their primary focus. But there are lots of other things that you can do that especially, well, all students will benefit from, but these are things that your, your, the students that you're working with will really need. So one thing is vocabulary. If students, struggled with sounding out words, they probably aren't reading a lot. If they aren't reading a lot, they aren't learning lots of vocabulary and content. So we need to reinforce vocabulary whenever we can. So if we're reading a very simple decodable story like frogs, which has lots of short vowel words, and I introduced this book, we'd read the title and we'd talk about the cover illustration. And I would ask children, what do you see on the cover? Where are these frogs? And if they don't know pond, I would tell them pond and so on. That's a typical kind of thing that happens, but we wanna elevate that. So I always preview the decodable stories that I'm reading with students. And I think about what's a tier two academic word that's not in the story, it won't be, but that I can use to talk about the story to elevate the conversation. So in this particular book, we're reading about frogs. One of the tier two academic words that makes sense to use to talk about is the word habitat. So I tell children before we, we get into the book, I say the place where an animal lives is called its habitat. Say habitat. So I have them say it so they hear it. That's activating that part of the brain. And I say, what's a habitat again? They repeat the definition of place where an animal lives. And so as we read and they're working through sounding out the words, I will stop every couple of pages and say, well, let's stop and turn to your partner and tell them what you've learned so far about a frog's habitat from the words and the pictures. And so they have a chance to process their thinking as they're reading and look for information and use the word habitat. So that really elevates and changes the kind of conversation you have around some very simple texts. And your, your older students will really appreciate that leveling up of that work. Here's another example. This is a, a grade one story. So it's a very simple story about a little girl who's going to Spain in the month of May and she's riding a train. So obviously we're working on long A words spelled A-I and A-Y. And when I previewed this book, I thought, well, she's exploring all of these wonderful places. So I thought, well, that's a word 
that, that tier two academic board that I will pre-teach and that we will use in our conversation. So I told students, we're gonna read a story today about a girl who's going to a new place and we will learn about all the things she will explore. Say the word explore. So they say explore. And I introduce it using Isabel Beck's define example ask routine because it's such a simple and effective routine. It's a quick routine to introduce a word. And the way Isabel does this is she defines it using very simple kid-friendly language, words they know. So I would tell them explore means to find out more about something. What does explore mean? And they repeat the definition. I give them an example that's relevant to their lives. And then I ask them a question that requires them to use the word. So I might say, well, turn to your partner and answer this question. What new place would you like to explore or find out more about? And I redefine the word, not redefine, I, I reiterate the definition in the question just to make sure they're connecting that new word to words that they know. Then as we read, we stop. We see that the girl has gone to a castle. So I say, well, what is she exploring here? What would you explore if you were in a castle? Turn to your partner and talk about it. So they're using the word explore. Here again, we're elevating the language, elevating the conversation. Once you've read through a story, revisit it and to continue to deepen understanding and develop early reading behaviors. There's so much more we could be doing. I ask a series of five questions. There's nothing magical about the five questions. They just go from easier to more complex. And each question has a different instructional goal for me. So in this particular story, I ask, I'm gonna show you the questions that I ask. But when I ask the question, I don't call on students to answer. I make them turn to a partner and answer first. So they're all processing language, uh, processing their thinking and using language. Uh, so the first question I ask is really basic. I just want to make sure they can read a word with a new skill. Keep in mind, these are long A words spelled A-I-A-Y. So the first question I asked for this book was, where did the girl go on a trip? Find the country's name in the story. So they have to go back here and reread so we're doing more reading to develop fluency, but it's with a purpose. So they will, they will, they will gladly do that until they get to the word Spain, they share with a partner, and then I can quickly see that they all found the right word. The second question is I prompt students to find in detail. So this is a very simple low-level question, but I require them to support their answer with text evidence. That is a really important early reading behavior to support your answers with evidence from the text. And that carries over to writing where they have to support their writing with evidence from the text. So this question is, what did the girl do in Spain? Find the sentences that tell this. And that's the critical part of the question. So they're going to reread, tricking them into doing more rereading, find the sentences that answer, turn to the partner, read those sentences, have a conversation, a discussion, a debate, an argument, whatever it takes to come to a conclusion. And then they share out. Lots of reading lots of thinking, lots of talking. That's what we wanna have happen with these very simple texts. Then I asked some higher level questions. What problems did the girl have on her trip? Find them. Where might the girl go on her next trip? Why do you think this? That's an inference question. A lot of these stories are really simple and some of the stories carry through the art. So asking inference questions, really easy to do. And then I always connect it to students' lives. What kind of big trip would you like to go on? And because I taught the word explore before we read, I would tack that on to one of the questions. What would you like to explore there? So we have another day using that tier two academic word. So just preview these books, ask these more sophisticated questions that require them to go in, do more reading, more thinking, more talking, really elevates the kind of work we want to do with very simple text. The other thing we want to do that a lot of these students struggle with is just basic sentence comprehension and work around syntax. Some of these stories are deceptively simple because they have lots of very simple words that students can sound out. We think, oh, they're very easy, but they could be very complex in terms of making meaning because there could be idea connections that have to be made across these sentences because the language is so simple we underestimate the challenges in making meaning. Let me give you a very basic example. Here are two sentences from the story. One day, Pam rode in a train. She paid a lot for it. Sounds very easy to us, very basic words. 
But in this first sentence, Pam is a specific name of a girl. Train is a, a specific name of an object. But in the second sentence, Pam was replaced with she and train was replaced with it. So in order to understand the sentence, students have to refer back to what they just read and make those connections. So that makes it a much more complex sentence. So we want to help children make these connections to make sure they're following the ideas. So what I will do is I will just, when we get to that second sentence, I will say, after we read it, who is she? What does she refer to? Just to make sure students know that it refers to Pam. So I will, I will connect that. I will draw an arrow. Yeah, she paid a lot for it. That's Pam. So we can reread the sentence. Pam paid a lot for it, just to reinforce understanding. When you get to these next two sentences, it gets even harder. She went to see a museum. She had to wait in a long line to get inside it. And I will ask, what's it? Some students won't know. The last noun they heard was line, so they might think line is what it refers to, but we know it doesn't. It refers to museum. So we're gonna connect those two, I, those two words. She had to wait in a long line to get inside the museum. So we'll reread that sentence after we've made that connection to make sure students are making these connections as they go from sentence to sentence. We want to develop that behavior in our early readers because when they get to your grades and they have these complex paragraphs, they need to make those connections. We can also do some really powerful syntax work for students to really understand that words have different pieces of information. And with kindergartners, I start very simply with what, who the sentence is about, so then the noun or the subject, and what are they doing? So that's the predicate or, or the verb. In kindergarten, you might get some additional sentences like, you know, she ran to the bus. So, you know, some prepositional phrases so we can, we can ask some questions about that. But when you look at this last sentence, it's really complex. She had to wait in a long line to get inside it. So I will break it chunk it according to those meaningful phrases and ask questions to help students understand that each phrase adds different kinds of information. So I will read a chunk and have children echo it. She had to wait. Echo it. She had to wait. Where does she have to wait? The children will say, well, in a long line. So let's read those two parts together. She had to wait in a long line. Why? to get inside it. So let's read all three parts. She had to wait in a long line to get inside it. Just chunking it and asking questions like who, where, why, what can really help students understand that different chunks of sentences carry meaning. Now it's good to, after you've deconstructed a sentence, it's great to construct complex sentences. So I would do the reverse. I would maybe choose a sentence or write a sentence that's about the text that we can construct something more sophisticated. So I might start with a sentence like Pam had to wait. So we know that's sort of what this page is about. And I will ask a question, where? Where did Pam have to wait? And so children say in a long line. So let's write that sentence. So I'd write the word, Pam had to wait in a long line. Why did she have to wait? Well, she had to wait to get inside the museum. So I'd write that sentence, Pam had to wait to get inside or to get inside the museum or whatever the students uh, said. And I would say, well, now we have two really great sentences about Pam. Pam had to wait in long line and Pam had to wait to get inside, but I wanna combine them into one big idea. So we're gonna construct a more complex sense. How can we combine these two? So Pam had to wait in a long line to get inside or Pam had to wait in a long line because she wanted to get inside the museum. You see what I'm doing? We're, we're constructing a more complex sentence. So we deconstruct a, a complex sentence and then we construct a complex sentence. So revisiting a text and just finding a passage that's more difficult and doing this kind of work or choosing a page and, 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 and constructing a bigger sense, a bigger idea around it. This is really important foundational work that we want to do with these very simple texts. You know, kindergarten, first grade, or if you're reading decodable text with your older students, making these connections across sentences and words and so on, so that when they're reading grade level text with you and you're having to unpack and make these connections, 
they're already familiar with how to do that because they practice on some easier, shorter text. So they're they're connecting those ideas, are able to help you connect those ideas when you're when you're modeling it. So that's a really important work. The other thing that's really important to do is when you read a decodable text, have children always write about it. Because if they've read a text with all of these words with the new phonics skill and you have children write about it, they have to use words with the new phonics skill. So you are forcing them to transfer that skill into writing, which is difficult at first, but they have the text there as a scaffold. So they can go back in and find those words. <clears throat> or you can have them, when you say you wanna have them write a retelling because they read a, a, a story that was fiction, you might have them go in and circle some key words they wanna use in the retelling. So that gives them a word bank that they can use. If it's informational, maybe they make a list of facts they learned or, or maybe they draw a picture and write about the most interesting thing. You can always provide some sentence frames and sentence starters. If you have multilingual learners, these could be at different levels of language acquisition as support to get them started, but encourage them to go beyond. Here again, those word banks can be very helpful. After they've written the piece, I encourage you to revisit those writings on subsequent days. So they're gonna reread what they wrote about the story that has words with a new skill and have them revise it based on things you're doing in other aspects of your literacy block. So if in your writing time, you're, you're combining sentences, <clears throat> have them go in and revise this work by combining sentences. Or maybe you're working on vivid verbs, have them revise it and add some vivid verbs. Or maybe it's an aspect of punctuation or grammar. Here again, connect what you're doing during the small group time to other goals, grade level goals. And it's very easy to do that through these kinds of activities. And don't forget, while we're building all of these basic skills, we want to make sure that we are simultaneously and equally building students' vocabulary and knowledge base. So when we look at what's called the simple view of reading, which a lot of people are talking about in the science of reading conversation, this was an old model of reading that came out in the mid 1980s by Guff and Tunmer. And what it says is that in order for students to understand what they read, it is a product of their decoding abilities, how they access the words on the page. So you're gonna be doing all this work to help them more efficiently access the words on the page but also their language comprehension skills. We're talking about their vocabulary, their background or content knowledge, and one without the other doesn't lead to skilled reading. So while we are building that foundation as strongly as possible, we know that we have to equally and simultaneously build that knowledge base and build that vocabulary. For our students who struggle with decoding, they read less. They encountered fewer new words. They encountered less knowledge. And so we have to provide it through our read alouds, through our conversations and so on. We really need to flood them with vocabulary and knowledge as much as we can. And that has to be an equal partner in the kinds of work you're doing for these older students. We know that students' ability to read longer, more complex, multisyllabic words is connected to their vocabulary. Because when we are working through these words, what are we doing? Once we get through it, we don't know if it's correct unless it's in our speaking and listening vocabulary. So we wanna make sure we have the strongest speaking and listening vocabularies as possible. We've probably all encountered words in print that we never heard in speech. And so we perhaps pronounce them incorrectly the very first time we did publicly. I know I've done that. Here's an example, this very first word. I had seen it in print before, but I never heard it. And I'm from a very rural community in West Virginia. We don't have fancy smelly stuff in our bathrooms. So the first time I saw this, I, well, every time I saw this word, I pronounced it in a, using my knowledge of phonics. And the first time I said it out loud, I pronounced it as pot pourri, <laughs> which of course was not correct. And everyone laughed that uh, I never heard the word potpourri. I remember years ago when I was in college, our football team went to a, a bowl game in California. And one of the activities that the cheerleaders and football players were going on was to go to this place that you see listed here. And one of the cheerleaders who was very good at phonics was so excited because she had never been to Yosemite. <laughs> so here again, she had never heard Yosemite. She 
did really well with our phonics, but couldn't connect it to what the real word is. So we want we want to really up the work we do in terms of building students' language. So those complex read alouds and so on are so important. So it's really important that we do a couple things, that we increase the amount of nonfiction read alouds that we do. Doesn't mean you just have to do nonfiction. Certainly you want to read really great stories. But increasing the amount of nonfiction really increases the amount of language and content students learn. And we know that when we have a cluster of books around a topic, so we're reading a couple of weeks, you know, lots of books about animal habitats or lots of books about uh, a, a particular point in history, what have you, that children hear the same words and and deepen their understanding of these concepts because they get this repetition across those books that we're reading aloud those words are more likely to take hold. You know, we have those interactions with them when we're talking about that and using that vocabulary. So whether you're using dialogical reading or, or whatever sort of read aloud protocol you're using that gets students interacting, that's going to be very, very helpful. So all of this plants the seeds of comprehension. And that is what our goal is, to help students do everything they can to make meaning from the text that they they read so that they can enjoy these texts, they can learn from these texts, they can feel when they read these texts, uh, understand better people around them and so on. There are lots of resources that I use in this presentation. One of the ones that I wanna highlight is the paper I wrote for the International Literacy Association. It's called Meeting the Challenges of Early Literacy Phonics Instruction. It's on their website, it's free and downloadable. I can also send it to you. And it summarizes in a very simple, short way, it's like six or seven pages, the key characteristics of early phonics instruction and some of the reasons why it fails, some of the obstacles that we have to unplug. And that might give you some additional insights into some of the things we talked about and other things you might wanna consider when you deliver the, the small group uh, supportive instruction for those students who haven't mastered those foundational skills. These are some of the books that I've written that can provide some additional resources in terms of word lists and activities and routines and things like that. So please feel free to, if you have these in your school library or your local, li local library, please feel free to, to check these out uh, for some additional ideas. There are also some online resources. The Florida Center for Reading Research, for example, has lots of digital resources ready-made activities and things that could be of value, along with many of these other organizations. Reading Rockets has lots of amazing resources that you can read up on some of the, some of the, the basic routines and things that we talked about. So that's just a brief look at a grade three through five phonics survival guide. I've given you sort of a starter plan uh, of how you can maybe think about organizing maybe 10 to 15 minutes of work for these students if you if you have that time to provide some intentional work with the skills that they need based on your assessment. And I'm showing you some of those key high impact routines and some things that you can do with older students so that you're doing something different each day, but something that gets at different aspects of, of word learning that they need. And hopefully this will meet the needs that you have with your students and we will get them on grade level and able to tackle those more complex, difficult tasks. I wanna thank you for joining me today. I hope that some of this was helpful. Please feel free to reach out to me if you would like more information, uh, if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint or any of the resources that I mentioned. So I wish you the best of luck with the students that you're working with. And there are so many things that you can do to really help them. And I thank you for all the work that you're doing. I know it's an incredible challenge, especially with the pandemic and all of the, the, the challenges that that has created. So, so uh, the best of luck, and I hope that these resources are helpful. Thank you so much.